she wanted to show men and women should be treated equally under the law. And she followed a step-by-step jurisprudence, which meant one small bite at a time. And she was very strategic in the cases she would choose, similar to the approach that we saw Thurgood Marshall take with a lot of the civil rights cases that came before the court, except now she substituted race for gender. And the brilliant part of how she did this is She knew her audience. She knew who she was talking to. I think the way she went about it was knowing how to pick her battles, whether it was when she was in front of the Supreme Court and choosing cases that would help and serve to educate a panel of nine men, or whether it was when she was uh, writing writing her uh, opinions. She was actually more toward the center when she first started, and she, she really was fair and impartial, because as much as people want the feminist, you also need an officer of the court. So I think a lot of people looking back, hindsight is twenty twenty, and they would realize that there were methods to her lack of madness that was sought after at that moment. If you're going to play the institutional game, it's a different game than the activist game in some ways. And your credibility in the eyes of these people who in this case, are sexist, misogynist, men who don't even want women working for them, you know, as clerks. Like, you know, she's trying to convince people who wouldn't accept her on as a clerk because she's a woman. Like, these are people with deeply ingrained things. But if she's going to go this path, if she's going to work on the ACLU's women's equality team and she's going to fight in the court system, she ha- she can't she can't be... Um, she has to be very aware of this and she has to incorporate it as, 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 as painful as that is um, into her practice. And, and I think it, it takes this <clears throat> incredible strength that I definitely wouldn't have. Like, I, I would not be able to take the criticism of people I, that I agree with. Mm. That shit would kill me. Like, like to have all these feminists that I agree with screaming at me about, about how I'm... And, like, I can't be public about... I can't be like, hey, this is just a strategy. I have to educate these sexist men... Like if there's if there's any, if she in any way reveals her hand publicly, it it ruins the whole game, right? It ruins it yeah. ruins her hand. So she has to go like, and I, I want to go back and like look at the videos to see if she ever like winked at the camera or you know like anything like this kind of like, guys like, I'm with you, you know? It's like yeah, <clears throat> you know like keep yelling at so, me, so so and that, you know keep keep yelling at me, like this you know I yeah. need you too, like I need you out there screaming. So what's the challenge here? Because I, I can see people coming back at this and going, okay, that's nice. And that's a very cool narrative approach. And I, I actually find it convincing myself and I need to look, it's making me want to kind of Google and get into her more. Mm-hmm. But I can also see people saying, oh, that's a clever narrative and a clever way to be, um, to instantiate yourself and kind of, you know, create your own personal legacy. Uh, people will criticize so many black politicians for kind of uh coming into political prominence and and not achieving a a set of goals at the standard of the activist community or 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 the black community or whatever that means um and they'll say be patient and i'm working on this and that like how do you know that you're dealing with a genuine rbg versus uh someone else perhaps i mean it's 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 uh this is what malik said you know hindsight's 2020 on this stuff it's hard to know, especially when somebody's rising in power, right? Like, you know, especially when somebody's rising in their own, in their own ambition and getting more salary and getting, you know, all these other things, it's, it's really hard to know if they're still in it to win it or not and to, or to what degree. And, but at some level it doesn't matter because at some level you kind of have to yell at them anyways. Like you, even if you know, like, even if this is your best friend from school and you guys have secret hangouts and, and, you, and they, like, you work out the plan together and blah, 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 you still have to go, you, your part of the deal as the activist side or whatever is still to go outside and scream at them that they're a reformist and, and that they're not doing enough because that's going to strengthen right. their hand to do more. That's going to open more space right. for them. So it's, it's um, <clears throat> anyways, and, and so Malik, Malik talked about this. Even when you had someone like, Justice Ginsburg on the bench, inequality still occurred. And the way the court works is they choose which cases to hear and which cries of inequality are going to move forward or which um, facets of society we're ready to to reform. And the 
the silver lining on that is a lot of that, for example, just with the, a lot of the recent decisions with trans rights and equal marriage rights, um, it, the, the court, the, these issues were before the court several times before they were actually heard and argued before, before the justices. And when they started being heard, it was when people were screaming and yelling for them. But it's a really complicated thing. So, for example, take Roe v. Wade, right? So she wasn't on the court when Roe v. Wade was decided, which guaranteed women the right to choose whether or not they want to have an abortion. Um, but she, when asked about Roe v. Wade, um, as somebody who potentially might have to vote, you know, or would, would vote on abortion-related cases later on, when she was asked about Roe v. Wade, she said she didn't agree with the decision. But I had uh, written a comment on Roe v. Wade and it was not 100% um, applauding that decision. And her reason for disagreeing with the decision was about process. I thought Roe v. Wade was an easy case and the Supreme Court could have held that most extreme law unconstitutional and put down its pen. Instead, the court wrote an opinion that made every abortion restriction in the country illegal in one fell swoop. And she said that you've, what we've done here is we took the state, which was Texas, which had the most strict anti-abortion laws, and we said these laws aren't correct. So we're wiping out all the, all the anti-abortion laws in the entire country based on this worst case example of Texas. Mm. And, and she said even people who are her argument was also so not her argument was not just in defense of process in defense of uh the um, her own credibility i guess as this um um what did malik call her like um uh, you know, somebody uh, an or a cl what is it? like an interpreter of laws and somebody who's who's doing a job you know they're not just there to represent their values and their and their worldviews they're right. they're supposed to be there doing a job and so this is how she defends her credibility in certain ways um which then she can then la use later you know when she has the respect of some of her opponents, you know, because uh, because of her principles, principled stance on things like this, I guess. But in the meantime, you've got hmm. you've got women and or and or anybody, men too, who are pro women's right to choose, saying that, like women are in serious physical danger as they're trying to get themselves abortions illegally. Like uh, you know, people die. Uh, there's serious complications. Um, like life is made miserable on the daily right now for all these people because yeah. of their lack of access to uh, safe abortion. And you're gonna put like the process of the court above that, so they can delay this another five years or something. And who knows what happens during that time? Maybe you know Ronald Reagan appoints a new justice, and and now we don't have the votes sure. and, and whatever. <clears throat> um, and you're gonna. You're going to put that at risk. You're going to put all the all these women, these thousands or I don't know, hundreds of thousands. I don't know how many women at risk. Their their and health. What's the and answer there? What? Yeah, it's I mean, a, she's playing the long game. Like like, and and I don't know. I don't I don't have. I don't know who's right on that one. You know, it's like like she's playing the long game. That's a saying, charitable. You like, and we could see it now. Like with the Trump nominee, you could see Roe v. Wade come into question again. And I don't know if Ruth Bader Ginsburg is right in the sense that, like, if they had have passed a better case, if that had been a stronger case, and this is now we're going to get something else, which is the perfect case, right? The search for the perfect case. Um, and if you had have had a stronger, picked a stronger case to win the abortion rights, would it be str stand up stronger in 2021 or whatever when this when this comes up again? I don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't know mm. the answer to that. And and I don't know I don't know the I don't know whether it's worth it to sacrifice another I don't know how many women and their safety and their basic rights in order to get a stronger case or or do you take it when you have the chance like when you know you're on the side of right do you just take right. it however you can get it when you get the chance um, this is these are unsettled, That's a tough question. unsettled questions for me here's my question for you how that interpretation of Ro I'm sorry of her playing the long game on Roe v. Wade. That's your interpretation or you read that somewhere? That's her, her description of what her logic was at the time. Well, I think probably not. Right. I think it's, a, I think, I think she, I think she, if I remember correctly, her, her statements on Roe v. Wade mentioned both things was mentioned that like, it was bad. I guess the term is jurisprudence. I keep hearing this word. I don't necessarily know how to use it properly. Um, you know, it's bad <laughs> functioning of the court. Like you shouldn't use the weakest law or the strong, the, the most extreme law 
and then try that law and then make a decision for the whole country. I, I have, she had some issue with the process um, in terms of the mm. credibility of the court um, yeah. and the justices. And then she also said, you know, as, from a strategic point of view, now thinking as as the woman at the ACLU who's trying to pick the perfect cases and blah blah blah, um, you know, she's saying this is this is not the the way you want to win the rights because it'll be weaker, like it'll be easier to yeah. overturn in the future. Yeah, this is something that this is a real thing. The the weaker case versus the stronger case, like the 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 why why make a strategy for states for states to to handle a certain issue versus a federal um, mandate and, and which of these is is the right choice. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, a, it's a whole political set of political philosophies as well as strategy. And I just, again, I see people, and so I wanna articulate what I think some people might, might how, how they might respond. So for instance, Breonna Taylor, uh, Breonna Taylor's killers were recently, um, no, you know, not given charges. Um, and it's to dis- to the dismay of a lot of people, and people are upset because I believe the AG of that state is a is a black man, and he's being he's being looked at as someone who 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 sold out, you know, in and isn't in, isn't willing to stand up for the right thing here. And how how difficult it is is it to notice if he has a legal point or if he has some broader strategy? Mm-hmm. Um, will we ever be able to look at this this young man? Uh, 15 years down the line, 30 years down the line, and just go, oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, he pulled it off, you know? You know um, what do you think? I don't even I know if this should even go up uh, as part of this. <laughs> but, I don't know but enough, I, I I don't know enough about, about the guy and, and his particular thing. I think my experience, my limited experience on Earth in general, is that the RBGs are the exception. And the rule right. is that people in positions of power are there because of personal ambition. And, when they, and that is the number one way to understand their decisions. Um, I think the people who are playing long games um, with the goals in mind, like an RBG, are the exception. And and so I think my general that rule is sense. until proven otherwise, I'm just assuming you have some personal ambition reason for making this unpopular decision or whatever it might be. And, I, and as you said, um, you know, the, it doesn't really matter much. You know, our role is the same. Our role should be to scream or to, I don't know, something about screamer I don't like. Yeah, yeah no, it's true. But you know, we should come it, up with a better one. Seems like um, there's a lack of control there. But um, but yes, it's our role to speak uh, denounce loudly sure. and, and yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, like I think I think okay. the screamer, what I mean by I mean screamer is like people who are standing primarily or principally or entirely for what is morally right you know what i mean who are who who are not who don't care what the process is and who don't care about the credibility of the court or the credibility of this particular justice who might later go on to do great things and we don't want to drag her through the mud now because blah 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 whatever people who are just saying no this is wrong this is right that's it this is my position based on that and and that that's who i'm calling screamers and that's how i identify myself um and yeah, I, and then the perfect case thing is interesting. We were talking about Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, we know Rosa Parks' name because of a perfect case situation. Um, otherwise, we would have known the name of Claudette Colvin, who was a 15-year-old um, black girl who in Montgomery refused to give up her seat to a white person. Um, I think it was like five months before Rosa Parks. Um, it became mm. a legal case, but in the process, uh, she got pregnant um with a married man and so it was determined that this is not the the this will this can't be the face of our movement for black rights because there's this other circumstance based in sexism in a lot of ways um that that but is, a political reality nonetheless that, you know yeah um just like the political ra- reality of of uh bus segregation and, and the rest of it this is a political reality something to be dealt with mm-hmm. or reality something to be dealt with uh-huh. and um the question about the strength of the argument is really important a question about not just the strength of the moral stance mm-hmm. but the strength of the of the argument which which involves the other side yeah you know when you're having an argument you you must consider that there is another side yeah and or at least that's how you that's how you argue well mm-hmm. And so, um, 
yeah, there is some anyone who's done a debate or done some sort of a thing like this. You you do some some preemptive thought about what the other side might say. How would they approach this? How would they strike this down? How would they? How would you lose the attention of of the the groups that you're trying to gain attention from? Yeah, and and so yeah, Rosa Rosa was the was the perfect case at the time. And, and Rosa Parks herself said like it couldn't be Claudette. You know, and first of all, they would have destroyed her. Like. You know, that as a 15 year old to go through that would have been, I can't imagine all the sexist mm. and racist invective that would have been thrown at her would have been off the charts, I'm sure. Um, the combination of all these things coming together and, and for somebody so young, um, even now, even now, can you imagine wild. back then, yeah. even now, um, you know, she would, she would be making a choice to, to sign up for some serious pain and trauma of probably for the rest, you know, mm-hmm. for as long as that case had the public eye. But like with the, um, with today's kind of like intersectional lens, the fact that the NAACP, Rosa Parks, and all these people um, are not willing to take that on, to also take on this other form of oppression, this sex-based form of oppression, like in today's terminology, you might even say, "Well, oh, Rosa Parks is a sexist. Uh, the NAACP are sexist um, because of their lack of courage for fighting both these battles. You know what I mean? Like for wanting to, for saying, no, right now we're going to focus on getting these racist segregation laws and taking those on. We need to find the perfect case. Sorry, Claudette, it's not you, uh, based on some of these other prejudices that are out here. And I don't know, this is an interesting question for me. Um, I hope, I hope we're at a stage where we're, it really is. where we're like, where the public is ready to, to handle intersectional fights, right? Where you can, You can say, oh, this person's rights were offended in two ways, or like this person is a victim in two or three ways, and they're all wrong. And we can have that, we can have that discussion and have that, that fight. But um, I, I I have to, I have to take, because I didn't live at that time, um, I have to, I have to kind of take their word for it. You know, that Rosa Parks and the NWCP, when they say, when they say, no, we would not have won with Claudette Colvin as the, as the face. 